Okay. Hey, everybody. Welcome to our 12th and final webinar in our year-long series for the Tribal Health and Adaptation Peer Learning Roundtables. Um, really glad that you're here for this uh, last hurrah, but uh, believe me, that's not going to be the last time that we offer training through the Tribal Climate Health Project. This is just the end of this particular series, uh, and um, this is going to be a good one because this is where we get to talk about sharing successes. So hopefully we're going to be ending this with some positive feelings. You know, there's a lot of uh, things to not feel positive about in the world right now. So let's uh, let's try to give ourselves a collective pat on the back by talking about what we've done well and what we've learned over the last year. So um, Angie, go ahead and uh, do your thing. Good morning, everybody. Nice to be with you um, at least one more time here. So yeah, like Shasta said, this is the last one. Um, I imagine we're going to get a few more people trickling in. Did you all have to go through the whole registration thing every single time? We're sorry about that. Me too. Yeah, I don't know what that was about because I, I checked the whole system there and it says on there, you know, registration once means accessing everything. So I don't know why that happened. It worked if I went through the original email that had the agenda on it. Uh, but if I went through the link that you just sent, they tried to get me to register again. Very strange. Yeah. So even though I'm putting that link in there, it's still sending people back to the registration page. I don't understand that. So yeah, apologies for that. But thank you for making your way through the thicket and uh, and getting here. Well, and the one good thing about that is we kind of know who was like, we have a record of registration. People registered every time they come. So we'll go back and look because what we said here down here if you attend 10 or more of these, you're going to earn a certificate. Yay. So we'll see, we'll see who, uh, who earned the big prize. Um, I think some of you, you, because you're the hardcore ones that are still with us. So thank you for doing that. We've had quite a journey over the last year together. Um, so just, you know, this is where we've been. We've walked through the whole process. We've dove deep on a bunch of strategies and tips and tricks and advice and have ended up and will end up with 12 of these resources at the end of the day where we have captured your insights and shared knowledge among all of you folks that have some experience doing this work and pulling that to wisdom wells and all of that is a resource that um, will be put on our website and shared with other tribes uh, around the country. So I'm really wanting to thank you for doing that work with us and helping us build out some additional knowledge here for the collective hive mind um so you know the trajectory here was let's talk through how to do this work and then assuming you've done it and you've you've started implementing um we wanted to think through well what does that really look like to report you know to be on the other end of it implementing and talking about it talking about the work and understanding is it what outcomes, what impact it's actually making? So that's what we're going to talk about today in this um, last session. And so our agendas are like slightly tweaked from what it usually is. We're going to go through our reading discussion like we always do. But <clears throat> in the lesson, I've kind of chunked it out in a way so that our what would normally be a breakout discussion is going to happen in three phases alongside the, the lesson. So um, get ready for lots of good interaction. And as always, we're looking for your experiences to be shared as we walk through this. So I'll do a little lesson on reporting and sharing successes. Uh, and just basically what, I, what I'm aware of and what I was able to find. And then we'll talk about your experiences too. And then we're going to, um, you know, if anybody wants to share more, we'll gladly hear more stories and then we'll close out and do a series wrap up and we'll look for your help on a little post training survey okay so the reading and actually it was more than a reading it was a video too and if you looked closely you would see our friend shasta bopping around <laughs> weaving things in the back <laughs> and um, visiting dams and things but this was an ap article Native nations on front lines of climate change share knowledge and find support at intensive camp. So this is a camp that recently happened, and it's just a good example of the topic we're talking about today, reporting and sharing successes, and I think in that case, probably struggles too. Uh, and I thought, you know, I pulled out a few quotes from the article, um, but I thought Shasta, you'd be 
great to tell us a little bit about that event and how it was useful in terms of sharing, you know, reporting and sharing successes. Well, I will start by saying that um, I almost didn't go to the climate camp because I am so oversubscribed. Um, I'm trying to find new ways to say busy. So oversubscribed is the word for today. And I thought, oh, I'm going to tell them I got COVID or something, you know, and, and, and not go. It was a week in Washington State at Olympic National Park in an actual camp, like a youth camp. And that was fun because we, the rooms we stayed in were actual bunks, you know, for, for, for kids and foam mattresses are about five inches thick that were not made for, um, you know, full-sized humans, <laughs> but it was fantastic. I am so glad that I went. And if you watch the video, uh, you saw some of the great opportunities that we had to go on field trips and to interact with one another and to share what we are all going through. And a lot of times with this climate stuff, you talk about what's going on and there's a lot of commiseration about how hard it is. And you know, this one was was no different. But at the same time, I actually left it feeling more energized and um, happy uh, about the work that I do than I have in a really, really long time. And it was being able to be in that group with all of those wonderful folks and learn from what they are doing that was really so meaningful. So I would say that, you know, as far as the success, it was actually less about what at least me personally, what I learned about what other tribes are doing, although that was certainly an important part of it. Um, but it was more about learning the experience of, or I should say taking away that experience of what it really meant to be put together like that for those five days where we couldn't escape one another. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm using you guys as sort of a a sounding board on this stuff. But for me as an introvert, which I know it's very surprising to hear that I'm an introvert, but I am. Um, for me as an introvert, usually I just want to get away from the group. And with this group, um, any opportunity there was to spend time with with my peers and colleagues, I, I took it. I even participated in the talking circle. Um, and we had a stick that was a, a drumstick. Everybody, whoever was holding the drumstick, not like a turkey drumstick, an actual stick for a drum. <laughs> Um, was able to be the speaker and I used it like a microphone and I didn't even realize it. I held it up to my face and was speaking into it like a microphone. So that, that became kind of a, a funny joke, but let's just go back to the successes. This was successful because not only did it bring people together, but it was about sharing knowledge. And that's exactly what we've been doing here is sharing knowledge. And that was so important because we had people all the way from my tribe has told me to work on climate change and I know nothing to people like me who, who was invited as a facilitator to, to teach some lessons. And it was, um, I think, very useful for all of us to see things through the eyes of somebody who's brand new and feeling a little bit overwhelmed, um, all the way to having the, um, the privilege of being able to share what we've learned and help those people's eyes open a little bit and make them feel less afraid of the road ahead. So that's my tutorial, or not tutorial, uh, what do you call it? Testimony. Testimonial. That's my yeah. testimony. Yeah, that, that is my testimony. Um, and uh, boy, I would love it if we could do something similar. But ATNI um, has has these climate camps on a regular basis. And so if you have an opportunity to participate in one um, as a, a tribal individual or somebody who works for a tribe or a tribal serving organization, I, I could not possibly recommend it more. So if you haven't watched the video and read the article, they're short and sweet. So I would definitely take advantage of that. Um, and in fact, maybe I'll see if I can put the, the link in the chat for y'all. Was anybody else there? No, yeah. Uh, that that video was touching. Oh, yeah. Colleen, go ahead. Yeah, Colleen was there. Oh, yay. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your experience? Hi, good morning. Hi, Shasta. How are you? Hi. <laughs> I was lucky enough to go to tribal climate camp. Um, Shasta was actually the facilitator for the group that I was in. Um, so I guess 
I originally tried to get someone from our region to go to the first tribal climate camp in Ghost Ranch, New Mexico last March and try as I might, you know, have every scholarship and travel opportunity laid out. Nobody would come with me. Um, and I just kept talking about it and talking about it and came the opportunity to go to Washington. And, and I brought two people along from native village of Taslina. And I think they may have fallen into the category that Shasta talked about, kind of the newcomers to climate change. Very overwhelmed, um, not looking to add too much new work, but the experience has given them this new vision that they're not alone. And it's not this negative, horrendous fight against evil. It's you know, just opening people's eyes, whether it's their council or the kids that they work with. It's just having the ability to talk about it um, in a kind of a profound way and, and seeing that there's hope, that there's adaptation strategies. Um, I know that we just had a little meeting about fish passage recently and um, Latonia actually brought up the Elwha River and she said, you know, if they can do it, we can do it. Yeah. Um, you know, and granted we're in Alaska, we're dealing with a lot of different um, obstacles, but she saw how far that they had come by just using their voices and being persistent. Um, so for me, it was, it was exceptional. You know, it, 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 it turned our picture here in the Copper River region around from me dragging people along, you know, please, please come. This is going to be amazing to, oh my gosh, we got to do this. You know, we're in this great group and we see that we're not alone. Um, and out of that, we were able to um, come up with a really great comprehensive approach to um, like adaptation. And we wrote a big proposal for a BIA TCR grant. And that was all kind of the result of this camp. Um, it was having that time together to just hardcore focus, um, have all of these mentors available to us to help tangle out these issues or or um, obstacles that we were having. Um, you know, people like Shasta were just, it, it was amazing really to have you um, because, you know, I'm I'm no expert. <laughs> I'm, I'm just one person, but to have all of these extra people around to say, hey, what about this? Or what about that? Or, oh, that tribe next to you is is working on this project. That would be a really interesting, you know, way for you to tackle this problem. It was just, it was amazing. Um, and I can't wait to go back again. And I'm really looking forward to the possibility of a youth camp. Um, that was one thing that we're really focused on is engaging youth in everything we do. And I know that that was something that came out of this camp specifically is that they're looking to do something targeted at youth. So I'm really glad that you brought this up. And yeah, thanks for letting me share my two cents. Thanks, Colleen. Yeah, it, it was uh, definitely uh, life changing, I think, for me um, and, and for, for a lot of others. So you know, I'm hopeful that we as uh, uh, the Tribal Climate Health Project can learn a lot from that uh, in terms of what we're going to be doing with some of our uh, in-person events, like our summit that's happening next, next month, um, so that people can leave with that feeling of not being alone in this, in this hard fight. So, um, but I mean, this could certainly just turn into the we're all awesome and we love each other and we support each other, you know, kind of a uh, uh, virtual talking circle. Um, but I want to uh, leave it to any others who uh, may have watched the video or, or read the article if, if to see if you have any anything you want to share. And if you didn't do your homework, that's OK. <laughs> Lori, go ahead. I'm super jealous of people that got to go. I wanted an excuse to go, but I couldn't find one. Um, and I've talked to a couple of other people that went and they too said that it was one of those like life changing events. And how could you miss sleeping on a bunk? But they did. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm so excited that it happened. And I mean, for me, it, it sounds like the tribal climate health meeting last time that mm -hmm. for me was life changing. Yeah. Um, and I, I just love that. So I'm, I'm glad you guys got to go and I'm super jealous. <laughs> so Lori, is somebody painting your house? No, this nice man is cleaning my rain gutters, even the best. 
I know. Make, I keep thinking, like, please be careful over there, man. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure he composts the leaves, you know, puts them into your, your garden compost. Pile. <laughs> yeah. But um, since, uh, since I'm in Fort Bragg, I'm thrilled that he is doing that for me. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. Thank you again, everyone, for, um, for sharing. Um, and uh, yeah, what, so what are we, what's next, Angie? Uh, well, you know, you're answering some of those questions down below there. And the third one you guys made me think about, what, why does sharing successes matter? And I think you guys answered that pretty well. And something I hadn't really thought about was just inspiration, right? So when you see others that can do it and succeeded like these guys, I mean, I was super jealous of the part about visiting the river and actually seeing this great success where the tribe was actually successful in um, restoring restoring their it sounds like restoring their salmon it's going well um i mean that's so cool it's so cool to see it in person so it's enough maybe it's not enough to even just to hear about it a little case study but to go visit that's an, that's incredible then you go back and feel like i can do it too i have, uh, a, question. I have yeah. a question about the camp in the article it showed what to me looks like mussels and called them clams was it clams or was it mussels or does it not matter um you know what there was a lot of mussels on the on the rocks um uh, but there were there were clams as well and there we actually got to have a um a clam bake and that was one of the other terrific things about it was was the um the commitment of the hosting tribes the Klallam tribes uh who who worked with us and shared you know cultural learning shared their successes you know we got to see where the dam was taken down we got to see where a beach had been restored because the river had been restored um and then we got to have this delicious clam bake where they they put the clams on top of the the, the you know hot rocks in the traditional way covered it with wet newspapers and and towels and stuff and like 10 minutes later pulled them off and we've descended like a flock of seagulls and just went nuts on those those delicious clams so those were clams um the mussels I don't, those might have just been mussels that they were showing on um uh, on one of the tide pool places that we um that we visited and yeah i'm seeing some stuff in the chat what was the camp called again so this is through atni the uh, associated tribes of northwest indians um, atni.org, I think is their website. And I think this was actually their fifth tribal climate camp. Um, and, uh, they, they have, uh, actually private funding and they have, they have foundation funding that, that pays for this. Um, so that's, uh, that's nice. They don't have the same, um, requirements that you do for federal grants, but of course there's other requirements with private funding, but, uh, I will, I will scare up the, uh, the link and put it in the chat for, for you guys who are asking. All right. Well, thank you. Great discussion. Oh, so so. Is that a clap? Oh, just a clap. No, no, no. <laughs> Anybody else before we close no, out? No. Yeah, no, I'm going to. Sorry about the wrong thing. But uh, so I work with several youth groups here in Arizona, uh, mostly uh, young people from high school age to college, like freshmen, sophomores. Uh, and so one of the things that uh, one of the people that uh, one of the groups called Equal Truth is uh, just. Um, uh, little kids, uh, tribal kids in the Tucson area. And so what we did and what we've been doing is looking at climate change and the effects on uh, on our tribes, our different tribes, because there's several different tribes that are represented in the group. And um, so Tucson, uh, the city of Tucson had an adaptation plan they put out. And so we sort of attacked it because we said that it did was uh, didn't cover the poor people, of fringe populations like tribal entities. And so we send our comments then. Uh, but the most important thing is that uh, the the Tucson, uh, City of Tucson adaptation plan was not all inclusive. And that's what uh, the young people were saying. Now it says it doesn't fit like, uh, it's not like the people that lived here for yeah, hundreds of years. It's more for the people, the tourists and people coming in and moving to Arizona and trying to change the, they're trying to put their political influence about climate change, you know, bringing that with them from where they're coming from, mostly from California. But uh, so I thought that was interesting. But the other uh, thing that we're going to do uh, next month is we're going to attend the water conference in Tucson. And that's a national water conference. And uh, again, they're going to speak on water 
that's life, but also the problem we're going to have in Arizona about groundwater and surface water because of the Colorado River system. And so um, it's pretty good to sit back and not say nothing, but to coach the kids into voicing their opinion from a Native perspective. So um, mm -hmm. we had several uh, environment, we call environmental camps. And in these environmental camps, we do uh, tell them to, uh, one thing that before they leave is to put a, a uh, mission statement for them as a group for what they would like to carry on as they get older. And so a lot of them have gone to college and then they, they come back once in a while and they tell us that they haven't lost sight of what we're trying to teach them about the environment. So there's been some success, excuse me, successes. And like everything else, um, the participation goes up and down. I mean, sometimes we have a good group and sometimes we just have a three or four who, you know, who are there, but sometimes we have like 12 to 15. So it's, it's very interesting um, to watch the youth in action when they're positive. Um, and, you know, hopefully we can start to, all the tribes can start to push uh, responsibility to the young people because, you know, we're moving out and they're coming in as the decision makers. And so I just wanted to talk about that, but I really don't, uh, really don't talk about these programs because they're uh, grassroots programs. And I think in the typical, uh, native way they're shy mm -hmm. they don't like the publicity but i tell them that that's where the action's at at the grassroots level so anyway thank you yeah thanks also uh, and then hope to hear more about uh some of that when we when we have you here in november Okay. All right. Well, I really appreciate everybody participating, and I like how many webcams are on right now. Thank you. <laughs> um, we're going to continue to keep this interactive, but let's go ahead and we'll kind of do what we normally do, which is wet the whistle a little bit and just dive a little deeper into this topic. So again, we're on topic of the day is about reporting and sharing successes, and I kind of like to show this. This is our little framework for how we think of doing um, climate and health adaptation work. So, right, we've walked all the way through vulnerability assessment, adaptation plan, adopting an implement. We talk, we've talked now a little bit about implementation. And now we're at this little phase here where you're kind of looking back. You're looking at what you've done, evaluating. And it's sort of like, well, why do you do that? What, what does it look like to report and share the outcome of what you have done? And so it might look like outlining your progress on all those adaptation strategies that you put in your plan. And overall, resilience trends, and we'll talk a little bit about what that might look like. And this gives you a chance to highlight areas that need attention or more success as possible. And then you're sort of preparing yourself for this next phase, which is an update. And then you're in this little cycle. So it's not the end, right? I guess earlier I said you're on the other side of the planning. You're really never on the other side of the planning, but you're at least on the side of we've got some experience under our belts, and then we can continuously improve and refine what we're doing. Uh, so that's one reason you might report and share. Um, another one is to justify or be accountable to past or new investment. So maybe you got a grant, or maybe you got an allocation from tribal council, and folks want to hear back about what did you do with that money, and did it matter? Did it, did it do anything? Did you uh, create impact that's that's useful. And sometimes you do that when you're looking for your next investment um, to justify that you're ready for the next tranche of dollars. Another reason is just to simply keep your community members and partners informed and engaged, right? So you go out there, you're doing all of this work. Sometimes it's complex, um, but you've learned a lot in the process. And now it's time to sort of translate that into something that your community can digest. Uh, what do they need to know about what you're doing? So not just what threats are out there, what climate change is doing to your community, but what you're doing about it and how it's going. So we'll talk a little bit about those, um, those kinds of approaches. And then another one, another reason to report and share successes is to recognize and reward success. You know, you may have somebody 
on your team that's really doing a great job, right? And you want to highlight that to tribal leadership or to the community or even just in to that person or that organization that's partnering with you to say thank you. We appreciate your work and we want you to continue. And the last one I could think of was to exchange case studies, best practices, lessons learned, much like what we were talking about. This happens a lot. Trainings like this or at summits, conferences, climate camps. Um, and I guess it's not just, so this is, I would amend this now to say not just to exchange knowledge, but to inspire each other. And then I was thinking about this and thinking there's really three key audiences when we share our successes, when we share a report. <clears throat> One is our decision makers, right? And that we'll talk about who those are and what that kind of reporting and sharing of successes might look like. Another is stakeholders. Stakeholders, um, in my mind, we'll talk about that, but that generally it's like your, your partner organizations, your community members, your tribal members, and then audience three being other tribes. Does that sound right to you? Does that sound like the three audiences of people you might report? or share successes with. And I'll just mention audience one is like tribal executives, tribal council, and grant makers or grant creditors. Does that sound like, you know, the kinds of people that you would want to share and report successes to? I see nods. Yeah. Can anybody think of any others? Okay. Well, hold on. Done. I I have thoughts. I just wanted to give other people a chance. <laughs> okay. I always have have thoughts. Um. Yeah. Tim just put. Uh. What about the media? Um. Osamu says tribal members. I, tribal members are going to be our stakeholders. Um. And uh. And I see Lori's hand, so I'm going to let Lori talk, and then I'll I'll fill in if she doesn't cover what I am thinking. Lori, go ahead. Well, I what I was thinking is based on what Celso brought up. Um. The one commonality. I seem to have found so far working with tribes is that the, the tribal members are, are very humble. And um, I just got back from working with a, a tribe who had said, oh, we've really not done anything with climate change. However, in talking to them, they had worked with the Army of Corps of Engineers, borrowed a sandbagger that and barricaded the whole reservation during the flooding and nobody on the res got flooded. Nobody. I mean, I think that's freaking amazing. And it went under everybody's radar because they just saw it as part of their job. So I think that the cultural pressures in this are important as well. Hmm. Yeah. That's great, Lori. I really appreciate that example. Um, and, uh, you know, humility is a big part of this is that, you know, it's not about getting credit for what you've done. It's just about doing it. You know, we do the work because the work needs to be done, not because we want other people to recognize that we've done it. But at the same time, and this is going to be my 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 point, and, and Tim gets to it a little bit with the media, um, I think that... Um, we might consider this to be part of the stakeholder audience, which needs to be fleshed out a little bit, but I'm thinking about just the general public. I want people to see the successes that that tribes have had and to um, maybe use them as, as examples of some best practices, especially when it comes to um, environmental justice and you know social yeah. justice, which things are so important. And I think for some of the other folks that I've worked with over time um, are for much, much larger populations. Now, some of our tribes are huge too, but I'm thinking, for example, of uh, the county of San Diego that I've talked with a lot about their climate planning. And they're like, we got to deal with 3 million people. And so they don't tend to really look at what's happening um, on, a, on a smaller level that could still be useful lessons for them. So I want, I want those bigger entities to see the successes that tribes are having and how humble they are about those successes. Um, and I see Robert has his hand raised. So Robert, go ahead. Uh, OCO, I apologize for jumping on late and I'm doing it late early. I know my counterpart, um, Jessica Worms, been able to join over the last couple of months. And I'm not sure if you've already said this and you kind of started alluding to like the bigger agencies or Sierra FEMA. We have multiple offices, like our Office of Resilience, uh, Colby Kennedy, who is our senior uh, executive, 
level for our tribal consultation. Uh, it would be an amazing person to be able to say things like this too. Uh, when you think about, like you said, city of Oakland, I think about even if the city at the highest level does not want to, you know, hear about this or like share this out, going to the department levels of like department, you know, uh, natural uh, resources, different departments like that, things that maybe deal with stormwater, things that have to deal with the impact of climate change when it comes to the city, uh, and they're a little bit more boots on the ground versus the administration up top and, you know, like let that grassroots feed up from the boots on the ground to the administration then saying, look, we're doing all these great practices, we're doing implementing. And then that kind of gets that story out there too. So I'll pause there. That's a great suggestion. And I, yeah, my finding is the same is that working with staff is usually a lot more effective than trying to go to the very top. Um, Colleen. Thanks. Yeah, the other thought that I'm having in terms of you know, what we can get out of sharing our successes is I see there were like executive orders passed in September and the federal government, DOI, et cetera, are trying to include um, like indigenous knowledge in a lot of their planning um, and policy moving forward. And so having these successes documented and shared like on a larger regional state or even national level would really lend to to that movement, I think. Like it actually will bring, look, we have success from doing these things. These are all based on indigenous knowledge. Um, you know, it just, it kind of bolsters that movement, I guess is what I'm thinking. Yeah, I 100% agree. And I'll share that I was fortunate to be invited to uh, the White House Summit on Climate and Resilience that took place at the end of September. And, you know, it's the federal government. They gave me like basically 10 days of notice, you know, but I, when you get invited to the White House, you go. Um, so I went and that was an opportunity for, for uh, sharing some of what we've done on the tribal side. It wasn't just tribes. It was uh, folks throughout the United States at different levels. But that's where you get that opportunity to, to tell people um, at the top, here's what's going on and here's what you can learn from these sort of little less noticed um uh, communities, tribe and otherwise, but you know, Lori, your your one your example is perfect. It's and it's also I think really important to show that despite the fact that maybe tribes aren't getting all of the resources that they need, they're still doing what needs to be done to protect their communities. And I don't want that to be seen as oh, you're fine, you're managing it on your own. As much as we did this even without your help, but guess how much more effective we would be if we did have you know more of that that help. So. Yeah, Angie, you we touched a nerve with this question. So <laughs> thank you, everybody, for Glad. your feedback. Uh, you know, I'm really, so if we had, if I could do this over again, we'd have an audience for, which would be like you're saying general public or maybe other levels of government. Yeah. And, and so I'm hearing, you know, we, that would mean we could also, and I would add to the right here, an important reason to report and share would be to teach, right? So teaching others what we know and elevating tribal knowledge and voices generally. Maybe. Yeah, That's I think we can add that to our wisdom well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tim's, Tim's point about the media, I think is really yeah. good because um, locally uh, up where I live, we had power cut off, which for our area means water has cut off because people are on wells. And the tribal chair you know, drove over to Costco, filled his pickup with water and brought it back for everybody. And that got into the media and then FEMA managed to get water to them. So um, it's it's nice. Well, thank you. And, you know, so we're going to dive into each of these audiences a bit more. I think we'll have even more robust conversation about how to do all of this. Um, and the last thing I just want to say just generally is most communities I see leave don't don't do a lot of this or they do a little bit of it. Um, and maybe it's a maybe it's a factor of exhaustion. Like you've made it this far and you've done the work and you just want to there's so much more to do. So you're just going to continue to do the work. You're not going to spend time, you know, advertising your successes because that doesn't even sometimes feel right. But um, it's a pep talk. Maybe this whole thing is a little bit of a pep talk about there's benefits to doing it. Some of it, you know, to get the buy-in on in certain things that you need and continued motivation for your entire community. So anyway, let's dive in. 
It's a busy slide. Um, would somebody mind throwing the mural link here in the chat? Because we're going to use that throughout. This is how we're going to be starting to track and throw down your thoughts on some of these discussion questions you see below. So audience one, we're going to talk about decision makers. Well, what do we mean by decision makers? We're talking about tribal executives. So maybe your tribal manager, or if you're in a department and it's larger, maybe your department head, um, folks that are basically going to make decisions. And then obviously your tribal Council and these are the folks that might need to be briefed on what you are doing and how it's going. Well, management perspective. Um, along with that, I threw in granting agencies. I mean, they're kind of critical decision makers here because oftentimes what you're doing is uh, the parameters of what you're doing is really controlled by the funds that you got in some cases. And so you need to be able to report back to those guys and share your successes. That's probably a lot of what you're doing. I imagine if you're doing this work at all, you're doing it because it's required. And it's not always like, I don't know that tribal councils are always requiring, even if the adaptation plan is completed, they're not always saying, hey, come back every year and tell us how it's going. In the local government world, you know, in some of my work, they almost always do that. Um, it kind of holds your feet to the fire. You could manufacture that in a way so that you are, you're, you're asking to be directed to come back on an annual basis. And you might think, well, why would I do that to myself? Why would I put extra work on myself to come back with a progress report every year? Um, and yeah, in my case, when I did this, when I was on the inside of working in a government, it was a way to make sure I kept things on the radar and made this a priority to decision makers and included them and continued to get their feedback. So like I said, it's a way to out, like what, the ways you might do this reporting and sharing successes might look like outlining progress, right? So progress reports is one way to do that. Um, and there's lots of different ways that I've seen this done. Um, and a lot of like questions uh, I have about like, the approach you might take. But so I'll share a couple of examples. So on the right here, this little table here is from the Department of Interior. This is their Climate Adaptation and Resilience Plan. I tried to find a tribal example of a progress report on an adaptation plan, and I'm sure they exist, but maybe they're just not like posted online. Easy for me to find. Maybe you all know of one and can share um, a link or even just share a thought. Um, about what it looks like, what one might look like. Um, but oftentimes they come in the form of these reports and some of them are pretty boring. Um, most of them are pretty boring, I would say. <laughs> um, usually there's a table of some kind um, and it's like, okay, it's a reminder. Here's the strategies that we said we were going to do in our adaptation plan and here's how well we're doing it, right? So in this case, um, the Department of Interior, who was required, I think, by the White House for the first time ever to do a uh, federal agency climate adaptation plan. And they, those guys are requiring annual uh, progress reports, right? So that's why this is being done. Um, so they have to report back and they're saying, okay, well, we said we're going to promote climate resilient lands, waters, and cultural resources. Saying All they're doing here is saying it's in progress estimated due um, date of completion, ongoing, and a brief description of progress. So that might be all it is. We're working on it. Here's what's going on. I've seen other models where you might give like a percent complete in terms of like the work being done, right? So we're 50% complete. You could kind of use a more specific metric there. And that's more of a performance metric, like if you, any of you have thought about like program evaluation or performance evaluation uh, in any of your work, this isn't specific to climate change. Uh, sometimes you do that, right? Like you look at how far along are we in this thing we said we would do. And so you might say it, that could look like a percent or like these guys are doing, how close are we, you know, are we, are we on track in our estimated date of completion and just a status update. Um, 
there's a whole nother set of out uh, types of metrics you can use because the whole goal here is to say, well, are you doing what you said you would do? So that's the that performance metric. And the other one is, is, does it matter? Is it working? Right? So how do you report on that? That's tr much trickier, if you ask me, because especially when it comes to climate resilience, say you're doing, I don't know, you maybe you, um, you assigned yourself in your adaptation plan to do a heat related or like a, you created a cooling center. You, I want to create a cooling center and that's what we're going to do. And we're going to do it by this date. All right. Well, we're going to do it in two years and we're 50% done because we got the design work done and we're, we've got funded or something. And at the end of it, when it's done, how are you going to report on whether it mattered? So tricky. Well, what was the point of doing a um, cooling center in the first place? Probably to reduce heat-related illnesses. Um, and so how do you decide whether or not you actually reduced heat-related illnesses? Well, that's a whole different kind of metric to be tracking. And you'd be going back to looking at any data you have about heat-related illnesses, perhaps. And if it's quantifiable, great. Or if it's qualified, um, qualitative, you might use that too. Meaning like, all right, well, we've, you know, our our health clinic has noticed a significant decline in heat-related illnesses ever since the cooling center was built. Something like that. So there's different ways to report on it. But like that's, ideally, you're kind of doing a mix of both. We, we completed this, it's 100% done, and it worked. Or maybe it didn't. And either way, if it's, say you're like, you're having a lot of trouble even getting it done, that's important information for decision makers and for your own team to say, some flaw is here or some obstacle is here. We're having trouble for a reason. And maybe it's that the funding fell through or you don't have enough staff or um, uh, there's a legal issue that was buried in the details that you weren't anticipating. Um, price fluctuations in the materials, whatever it is, it could be useful information. So you can kind of go back to your plan or decide whether or not you need to kind of change or adapt this particular project or strategy. That's important, right? You just don't want to sit there stuck. You want to move around an obstacle if you can. Uh, or say like you are killing it, you know, right? You really like weep. We did a cooling center. We did it faster than we thought. It's working like gangbusters. And actually, we're really good at this kind of thing. Maybe we should do more stuff like this because this really worked. Right? It's just a, it's a tool for you to make ongoing good decisions as you go. Uh, so that's like a couple of examples. I'll show you the other one. This is from California. The state um, has a climate adaptation strategy, and it calls this report an implementation report it's basically a progress report this is from 2022 this is just a snapshot of one of their pages um they use like infographics and prettier graphics in general than just tables um it's not particularly detailed so what i'm telling you about like the ideal way to report i don't even see the state of california or the federal government doing it very well so, so <laughs> don't feel overwhelmed or pressured because this is hard. I think this stuff is really hard. There's a whole agency in the state of California dedicated to figuring out how to develop resilience metrics. And it's a year, years long process, right, Lori? Salma, you guys are probably part of that. So and we're trying to figure it out here at the Tribal Climate Project. I'm gonna show you one more thing. Oh, I think I am. I can't. Oh, there we go. So you all have seen me talk and talk about the easy tool. I'm going to show you one feature here. Oh, we're fetching your file. But, you know, we were trying to think into how we can help tribes in the easy tool. Um, what it, yeah, it's too big. No, oh, this isn't with me right now. Well, I might pull that up a little bit later. Uh, it's just my computer. All it's going to show you is if you've been in the easy tools, 
we're trying to help you think through it, right? So it's like a strat. If you have your strategy written out, it just gives you a percent complete and a place for notes, right? So that's all. It's already low. The easy tool is already built so that you can plan your strategies out and prioritize them. And when you have that list, then all you, one thing you could do every year is go back. And we do this with Shasta because she has some, Paula has some grants that allow us every year to kind of check back in. We go through that list. We change the percent complete. We check back in with some departments. We write up some notes and we see how we're doing. We just, how are we doing on these strategies we said we were going to do? Are we on time or not? Um, the other thing that the easy tool is attempting to figure out, and we have new grant dollars to do it, is to tie back to that resiliency, right? Are we building climate resilience? So how do you take that? Um, how do you take that progress and decide whether or not it, it mattered? Did it work? Are we are we more um, climate resilient today than we were before we did this thing? So we're working on it too. I guess that's the long story. We're trying to figure it out. Um, it's not easy, but I want to hear from you guys. Um, Okay, I'm sorry, that was the one here. Last thing is, again, justify or be accountable to pass their new investment, right? You got to report on your grants, especially if you want another one. You got to tell your tribe how you spent the money, especially if you want more. Um, so those sometimes look like the exact same thing. Sometimes those look, but that might look like a grant report or it might look like an annual kind of progress report. So my discussion questions for you all, I mean, feel free to respond to any of this, correct it, tell me about your experiences, but... I want to know how do you know that your work has led to greater climate resilience? Do you know? How do you know? Um, and then I'm asking, what metrics do you use to evaluate progress, performance, or outcomes? And how do you track those metrics? Where um, uh, where does data come from? Multiple where data comes from multiple departments and sources? Those questions are in our mural. I'll go ahead and turn myself over there, but the mural link should be in the chat, right guys? It is, and I will put it in uh, one more time just to bring it up to the front. Um, but yeah, the same questions are are in the mural board. Um, and I will, um, we're happy to let people, uh, you know, unmute and, and chime in on any of this um, or, you know, go to mural and you can see there on the bottom right, there's a, um, a little area where you can choose what you're looking at and you can zoom in so you can see things more easily. Um, and then uh, just double click on the space where you want to type something. It'll create a little post-it note for you. And then you can type into the post-it note uh, your answers to some of the questions. So we see that uh, Tim is a visiting shark and uh, from Grayton and uh, he can type some things into his little post-it. Excuse me. Ah, I guess I'm allergic to sharks. Well, but as you guys are thinking general... about, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Shasta. As you guys are thinking about this, and I'm gonna uh, just give some of my thoughts out loud uh, rather than typing them in. So, how do you know that your work led to greater climate resilience? And I'll be the one to admit that I don't always know. There can be, at least for me, a tendency to think, hey, we did a thing. So, you know, of course, it's going to lead to greater climate resilience. But we don't necessarily know that. So this is where I'm going to mention the word data, where I think the smart thing to do, but we don't necessarily think about in the beginning, is to have a baseline. What is our baseline? And what do we want to qualify as improvement from the baseline? So Angie's example had been a cooling center. If you establish a cooling center, you're like, great, there's now some place people can go if the power goes out and we've got generator backup, they can go where there's AC. Um, but have we actually seen anybody go to the cooling center? Hmm. And if your cooling center is always empty, then maybe that tells you it's not really leading to greater resilience. But it's also going to be leading to questions as in why is that cooling center empty? And if you 
quiz your community, you might find out that everybody says, well, I have a generator too. So the generator was running my AC, so I didn't need to go to the cooling center. Or maybe it's going to be, gosh, I didn't even know about the cooling center. So you need to advertise better. Or uh, uh, I could have used the cooling center, but I don't have a car. And I'm certainly not going to walk the mile from across the river to the Paula Gym in 100 degree heat. Um, so I can get to the cooling center. And then actually this, so Lori just put in the chat, any cooling center needs killer Wi-Fi, 100%. And we talked about this at the the summit in uh, or the meeting in Washington. Um, somebody from another community said, nobody wants to go to the cooling centers because it's basically just a room with, with folding chairs in it. There's nothing to do. We need a foosball table. We need a TV. We need bean bags. We need um, board games. We need things for people to do. We need coffee and snacks. You know, um, people aren't going to go if they're just going to sit in there and maybe they're not hot, but they're also not entertained. <laughs> so maybe there's a better solution. Um, and that's just one example. So, you know, it, in the abstract, a cooling center it has led to greater climate resilience. You can feel great about that. But if people aren't using it, then it didn't really work. So, that's your baseline. Um, and if the thing is brand new, then maybe you're going to have to see from from uh, from hot season to hot season. Year one, we only had one visitor. But year two, we improved upon what we learned from that experience. And now we have entertainment. We have snacks. We have transportation. We have community check-ins to make sure people uh, are getting where they need to go. And, and year two, we know it led to greater climate resilience because on the hottest days of the year, we had 50 people hanging out in our cooling center. So long, complicated example, but that's really what you need to know uh, that your work led to uh, to greater resilience. Um, I would also say, listen to your community members. And even if it's anecdotal, uh, it's still a data point in the sense that somebody can say, you know, wow, I, I was really thrilled about your plant giveaway. And I now have um, 27 new native plants that I've planted in my yard and I have a more resilient, they may not use this language, but I have a more resilient garden that requires less water. You're like, booyah, you know? And we did do a plant giveaway and there were people who were like, I didn't know you guys gave away plants. They were thrilled, you know, and, and getting them to grow those plants, um, green, greenhouse gas emissions reductions, you know, trees that are drought resistant are more cooling for their homes in those hot times. Um, yeah, and Robert in the chat just said qualitative data matters. And my my anthropology heart is like, yes, qualitative data, listening to the people. And one last thing, because I'm I'm doing my my anthropology professor lecturing here right now with my finger. Um, this is something you actually learn when you're doing um when you're trying to do work with with communities. It's not gonna work if you don't do something that's in line with community values and existing behaviors. So you can't come in and expect people to start doing something that they would never have done in the past just because it seems like a good idea. So um, I think that's really important is that you've got to do that baseline data as well on, on the kinds of things that people are willing to accept um, and, and then develop solutions on the basis of what is and is not um, okay. For example, kids may not want to go to the same cooling center where the old people are hanging out because they feel uncomfortable. So that tells you, all right, then we need to have separate zones if we can. The kids can go to the gym, you know, teenagers can go to the gym, um, and the the, the grownups can go to the, the community center, you know, um, things like that. That's just a, a very minor example. But if the community is not going to accept it, it's not going to work. So that's an important thing to have in mind as well. Wondering if anybody wants to think about one of your strategies that you may have already implemented and try to answer this question. How do you know it led to greater climate resilience? Give us an example. Yes, Colleen. Um, okay, I'll use a really simple example. Um, we, and I was actually working on this for the last couple months, we got a food sovereignty grant um, and we ended up paying um, community members or, or village members to harvest wild berries. We know that Alaskans on average 
pick about five gallons of berries a year. We know that that's a significant amount. We know that health benefits are amazing. Um, it gets people active. It lends to intergenerational knowledge. You know, maybe a kid wants to go out and pick berries. So they ask mom, hey, where's our berry patch? Where do we go? So it has all of these great benefits. Um, so I'm actually working on my report out right now. And number one, participation. You know, having people actually participate in the grant is big. Um, I'm not going to go out and pick 200 gallons of berries to pass out. Um, <laughs> number two, like how many, like just a like a quantitative metric would be like how many gallons of berries did we produce um, over two and a half months, so ten weeks. We produced over 140 gallons of harvested berries. We paid each tribal member $35 a gallon for that harvest. So that's like our quantitative. Um, we know that of those 140 gallons, we provided fresh wild berries to 380 local families. We only have a population of like 2,600 in our whole region. So we know that we reached, you know, like way more than 10, I think I was like 15% of our population with this program. This is a tiny little, like, you know, $15,000 grant. Um, so for us, we know that we gave to this climate resilience because we highlighted the importance of berries. We highlighted the intergenerational knowledge. We um, had a workshop on specific health benefits of berries, you know, antioxidants, like decrease in diabetes, decrease in heart disease, you know, increase in activity and exercises. Um, and how do we know that this worked? Well, we heard about it in the council meetings. Um, you know, we actually had like our council presidents going, oh, well, we heard about this. We didn't know if it was successful. And when we got to report out these numbers to them, you know, eyes were raised and, you know, discussion occurred. And for that, for us, like that was proof of climate resilience. Um, I think the bottom line is like, if we hadn't done it, we'd have no idea how many people were out there picking berries. But in this way that we know we have at least, you know, this many people picking, this many people receiving, um, six out of seven of our villages all got multiple gallons of berries. So they all went out and did um, workshops on making jams and preserving the berries. Um, so I think a lot of it was qualitative, but we we ended on those metrics of how many gallons did we get? How many people got the berries? Um, and and that was like our only like quantitative, but we feel like it was successful, I guess. So I think a lot of it was qualitative. That sounds That's incredibly successful. <laughs> yeah. Berries. <laughs> yeah. And now I'm like, oh, berries. Are you, are you talking berries. about like uh, uh, blackberries and Marion berries and uh, um. uh, yeah, we've got blueberries, we've got lingonberries, we've got bilberries and bearberries and highbush cranberries and salmon berries. Oh. You know, a lot oh. of it actually, we ended up going into the schools, into some of the tribal schools and making sure all the kids could identify um, the different types of berries. You know, we brought in pieces of the berry plants with the berries attached into the little desks and held them up. And, you know, do you see the difference between this plant and this plant? And we get to take them outside and see if they could find those like, you know, in the wild <laughs> next to the school. Um, yeah, I think it was really good. I think it was successful because it was specific. That's fabulous. And and if you remember at climate camp, one of the stops that we made, there was a huge thicket of blackberries next to, uh, right. to where we stopped. And some of the ladies went out and picked Me. like a big, was that you? <laughs> yeah. Yes. A huge bag of berries and we passed them around on the bus and it was just like, wow, well, we were like a bunch of bears getting ready for winter. <laughs> yes, that was like week one of our of our um, program. So that was the kickoff, I guess. Oh, <laughs> fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, I really love that example. And I want to say I'm super impressed with the data collection. Like that sounds like hard work. Uh, and it's a really good example out to like, like, see if we could go even deeper on it for a second, just for like all of our 
learning experience. But why, so why were berries important for your climate resilience? Um, you know, our region is still heavily based on subsistence resources. Um, for example, uh, I guess, I guess big picture, we're a food desert. Um, you know, we're 200 miles away from Anchorage. We're 70 miles away from Valdez. Um, you know, 99% of our food comes from like out of state, basically. We know that Anchorage only holds five days of food at any given point. Um, this spring, our only highway that would lead us to Anchorage was washed out by flooding. You know, so it, it's like these alarm bells are going off that if something happens to us, we won't be able to get food from outside of our region. And so it's really highlighting our ability to go out and procure subsistence resources. 51% um, of our food is salmon. You know, that mean that's a huge, huge, huge thing. And so we focused on berries because it was simple. It's tangible. You know, probably 80% of us have a little berry patch, like right outside our door, right outside, um, you know, your school. Um, it doesn't require an ATV or a snow machine or even a car to go get. So it was something that, you know, a, a kiddo could just walk right outside and do um, something that an elder is going to benefit from in two minutes when they get these berries. You know, it's that instant um, feeling. Um, I think another reason we focused on berries is because I'm like obsessed with the whole food being the center of this climate resilience. I think it ties to culture. Um, it it keeps us healthy and safe. It gives us good emotions. You know, that just connects to our limbic system. You know, we get the emotion, we get um, memories, we get all of these things from one little center in our brain. So here we're eating, we're having good feelings, we're telling stories. And it just, it's really, it was a good starting point for us. A foundational piece. Thank you. That's really awesome. So then, you know, at, while we do anything we do, the <laughs> check back is, did we, did we do the thing we meant to do? Like the reason we picked this strategy was because we wanted it because it had value for food, um, food, like sustenance, and it has cultural value as well. It sounds like. And so did you build sustenance and did you protect this cultural value? I think we did. Um, I So I basically worked, um, we have a food bank attached to our, I work at a, um, a nonprofit tribal health consortia. Um, and so we have a food bank attached to us. And so that's how I was able to gather a lot of this data. And yes, I think by providing, you know, 380 families with berries, yeah, we provided sustenance in that way. Um, and then hearing the stories of the families getting together to go pick the berries, whether it was mom, you know, like carrot and sticking the kids or giving them this motivation to come out and get the bear. Oh, you'll get $35. You can go buy a toy or whatever. You know, it, 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 there was still that um, it's like a motivation to get back into the cultural swing of things, you know, and then from the council meetings, I'm hearing um, a lot of the elders really focusing on, you know, once this knowledge is gone, it's gone. You know, we have such a small population of Atna, um, like left, who really know and are ingrained in these traditional practices. Um, and so hearing the stories about how a grandkid came to them and said, yeah, you know, where do we go pick our crowberries? Or, you know, where do you get your high bush cranberries? I think that is qualitative proof um, that that cultural heritage was highlighted and maintained. And yeah. then, yeah, when you're at that level, trying to, if you're trying to quantify that outcome, how hard is that? Super, super hard, right? Yeah. I mean, you can go yeah. out and you ask the, you can survey your community and say something like, did do or are, are the children now aware of, of very picking practices like is there an increase in that like there are ways to try to understand trends and, and increases or say you know in an ideal utopian non-existent world you'd say okay well we used to have 500 families that were food insecure three months of the year and now we have 
half of that. Or, you know. Right. We took a lot of photos. Um, the grant was through First Nations Development Institute. Um, amazing resource. Um, and so photographic and video evidence was a good way. Um, one of the last little pieces of this was um, teaching the kids how to propagate berry patches or, or maintain and care for them. Um, you know, whether they're topping uh, the top of a raspberry cane. Um, I showed up at the schools with big five gallon buckets of raspberry canes that we had pulled from a patch near a river, you know, and we had the kids go out, find a little place and they're, you know, burying their raspberry canes and waiting for next season. Are the canes going to come up? How many are we going to get? Are they going to produce berries? You know, can we do it again? Um, so I think, yeah, it's really hard to quantify the qualitative data, right? Um, but I think it's the stories and the photographic mm -hmm. and the evidence. And then um, I think the propagation tactic was good because it, it it's like leading into the next season, right? It's not like, okay, we pick berries and it's over. It's, oh, you know, all of a sudden we have raspberries outside of our school door. Where did those come from? Can we make that bigger? It's just like leaving those, like those, uh, like resonant thoughts. Thanks so much for sharing that, um, sure. that success. Um, and again, I just, I just want a giant berry salad now. That sounds so good. Um, I'm sure that if I was out there picking, you know, half the berries would go in my mouth first and then the rest would go into the, the bucket, which I'm sure is common. Uh, but I just, I want to point out too, that, um, the kind of data or the uh, the measures that you have for helping you determine whether you've had success is really going to change too, depending on who your audience is. You know, so um, qualitative data is sometimes all you need, depending on who it is you're trying to uh, show you've had a success. So I think for your families in this instance, that qualitative um, reaction of we got berries and our kids are learning is is really important for that audience. Whereas for a grant agency, that might be more of the quantitative. We want to see actual numbers, you know. So it, and and that actually brings into that difference between indigenous knowledge and and you know Western knowledge in terms of who wants to hear what. And we know agencies, governments, um, you know, leaders oftentimes want to hear. We want to know exactly what this money did. You know, what is the what is the value of it? It becomes very economic. Um, but for our communities, they want to know that somebody cares. Um, and so how do we show that caring? And it's through youth participation, through elder participation, through families that are nourished, through knowledge that is being shared and perpetuated. And I love the idea of the raspberry cane. I actually planted a new plant recently and I've been going out looking at it. I'm like, are you growing little plant? You know, it's it's very exciting. And that's actually, for me, that's very dorky to, to feel like I'm connected to my plant, but I, I want my plant to grow. You know, that's not, that's, I guess it's both, you know, it's a yes or no data point. Did it live or not? <laughs> I'll have to um, add to this Shasta that, did you know that smelling dirt and humus like soil actually releases oxytocin in our no brain? No way. Really? And that's the same chemical that we get from breastfeeding a baby. You get this like deep connection. So it's, that's it's amazing. the full circle, full circle. That, I'm totally going to go and like plant my face in the dirt in my garden when I get home. <laughs> oh, well, does anybody, is anybody else want to add in? Because I think we're moving to the next, uh, the, the, how do we track, but yeah, Celso, please. Yeah, so um, well, on our nation, we live in the desert, so we're in desert. And so um, as far as our climate adaptation plan, um, we as a people decided that we um, were worried about two things more than most. And one of them was the extreme rain events that happened during the monsoon season, or even right now, like the Hurricane Norma coming through um, and then turning, becoming a tropical storm that gets on land and bringing excessive amount of water. Um, so what we did is that um, one of our villages, Vamor, has a has a flood problem because it's next to the Vamor, Vamor Wash and brings in a lot of water from Mexico. And so they've been under threat for years. And um, so we asked, um, I asked council to give me $2 million to, to build a flood reduction barrier, a levee, 
uh, to remove that water away from the village. And so uh, it got tested this year at a 50 year um, flood and um, it kept the water out. So it was successful. The village was happy. Council was happy. Um, so the, the how, how do we measure success is that now the council is gonna give me $16 million to protect two other villages. And now they're opening up um, for the future. Um, they want me to, to at least turn in um, um, a DEM or a floodplain analysis for 10 other areas on the village. So we are determined to use $86 million to correct uh, or to reduce our flood uh, our flood problem here on the nation. And that's all coming within the nation's money, no federal money. We decided that we can't wait for the federal government to, uh, there's just so much trouble sometimes. It's a long and tedious process to yeah. get flood reduction money from uh, from FEMA or um, or the Army Corps. So we're going, uh, what I've always said, that um, the Calvary isn't coming to save us. We have to do it ourselves. And so um, that's how we measure success. So uh, for this year, we're uh, starting, uh, we already done all the work, the engineering work and planning. Now we're in the construction phase. And so uh, I'm using $7 million from the $16 million they're going to give me to uh, complete this project, at least by the end. Uh, it's a two-year project because it's it's it's, a com it's going to be complex. But um, so that's how we measure success. I we Every year, our budget, uh, when we submit our budgets to council, we have to put, put uh, we, we uh, provide them with performance measures. And then we give mm -hmm. quarterly reports. And if we use any, uh, like the BIA or EPA, we turn in quarterly reports about how we use the money. So we have, we can track our month, our time using man hours and completion and deadline dates. And so um, we just try to keep ahead of everything um, only because I think, uh, you know, that's what we do. I think we, uh, the Water Resource Department for years, and I've been a director for director for the department for 22 years. And so um, I'm an older person as well. And I, when I was some 71, so 20 years ago, I saw the same problems we have as far as heat and uh, excessive water flooding. And so uh, using my knowledge and using my, uh, what I have scientific and, and technical background, uh, uh, we did a lot of work preparing for what we're doing now. And so we just needed the money. And so um, our success is that, um, you know, is measured by the completion of these projects. So, hmm. so it's a good it sounds story. Like, it sounds but, like successful completion and that the information developed in these ports was valuable, valued by the council, it answered some really important questions. Sure, and I think what most people so our our reservation is about three million um three million acres, uh, it's pretty big, and um what I did is finally they the tribe gave me um, two million dollars no no one point five million dollars to do um, DEM or DTM modeling for the entire nation using uh, co uh, partnering with the Pima County. The Pima County, their GIS program, GPS program. And uh, so we have um, this information that I've been requesting for 20 years so that we can help uh, consultants and other, the Indian Health Service and um, any other people that are trying to uh, uh, help us build better infrastructure. And so it's a big deal. And so since our whole nation has these DEM models, or DTM models, whatever, what elevation models. I think that was the biggest thing. You know, if I uh, retire, I think I would be happy that at least I got the DEM models because without those things um, for the entire nation, you know, a lot of our projects, Indian Health Service projects and our utility projects, uh, now they can move forward because they have that information. So, um, towards the end of my career, I'm starting to see a lot of the things that I thought when I was 20 years old that they'll never get accomplished. So personally, 
um, you know, it's a personal, I base it, that I'm happy that finally came to this state, uh, to uh, successful stories. And so um, when I retire, and I don't know when that's going to be, because they won't let me retire, my <laughs> people, you know, so, um, so I'm going to hang on as long as I can, at least three more years. Um, for this new administration of four more years. But um, but one of the things that we did know and we did change in the adap adaptation plan, somebody brought it up earlier, is that we have five recreation centers um, spaced uh, across the nation. And these are big buildings with a lot of um, cool air conditioning, water, you know, basketball courts, uh, a lot of room to bring in cots and food and and uh, and they do have multimedia stuff. They have everything that if they need to come in for cooling centers, well, we modified that lately. Where I think I brought this up in this discussion is that I told everybody um, that council is that you know if you have a facility in your community that has air conditioning and water, and it's and it's in a community, it could be a community building it could be a hop uh, uh, recreational place it could be a recreational any place that had water and a bathroom and um, um, water bathroom and cooling air conditioning that those are going to be I consider those cooling centers instead of going to a rec center where you may need a ride transportation to get there uh, you can go within your community a tribal building and they and a clinic, anything that has air conditioning, that is your new cooling center. Because you, if you can't get to a cooling center without transportation, then you need to, to be able to within your community to get it right to the closest cooling center. And so, because I made that statement in council, um, I understand now that you know, that I saw a PSA come up, public service announcement come out that says if they're during the heat, during the heat waves we had during the summer, they said, make it to your nearest cooling place. So we actively changed our climate adaptation plan to address that. So I thought that was cool that uh, people are listening to what I'm suggesting and they they don't have to do what I say, but I think when they think about it, it makes more sense to adjust to adjust the way we're dealing with climate change as it's happening, <laughs> because that's the those are observations and experiences that we develop as we go through this climate change. We can actually say that didn't work. This is working now. So I just thought I would bring that up. Yes, so, I'm so glad you made that example um, because that yeah. That's a really important piece of doing this like progress analysis work is you were able to identify that cooling centers that are required transportation was not something that was working well and you could change course. And also the, the, an excellent point that um, what we think is going to happen in the future five years ago when we started our plan may not be what's actually happening when we get to the point where we're going to be reevaluating our plan. and. Uh, here at Paula, we're at the point where we're going to be doing a revision to our, our first climate adaptation plan. And there's some stuff happening that maybe we didn't anticipate. Um, and uh, it's a bummer that sometimes it's bad news, like, oh, things are warming faster than we thought. Um, or, But maybe some of it's good things, like we're actually having better um, success with people switching to, um, I don't know, uh, electric vehicles. I'm here in California right now, the down in San Diego, the gas uh, gas prices are over six dollars a gallon, so that definitely uh, incentivizes people to do electric vehicle stuff. So maybe that's that's a positive thing. Well, um, with the EV, um, a, a tribe I'm working with got a grant. They installed all these EV chargers. They got vehicles. They got a grant for vehicles. It's been four years, and PG and E hasn't hooked them up yet. So, um, are you serious? Holy Lori, yeah, I got okay. some committees for you. If yeah. you're interested in that. Yeah, absolutely. Because I mean that that part of the, you know, it's just like there has to be some whip from the state that provides these grants that 
forces PG&E to take action because that's ridiculous and they would never fail to hook somebody up that wasn't a tribe. Wow. Well, there's yes, probably the a BIA or... thing involved there too. The BIA always has to be involved in doing the, the easement for the electric. Anyway, that's yeah. a different webinar series where we have a climate policy action plan where we make things happen on the rules and, and, and government side of things, which I would love. I would love that. I'm a policy nerd. Anyway, moving on, I think we're, we're, uh, we were doing so, such a great job on some of these things that uh, we have other questions we want to try to get answered in the 40 minutes we have remaining. Yeah, sounds good. I hope you're like me as you're thinking about these things. I love thinking about metrics. It's such a nerdy thing and it's such like, but to think about what at the end of all this, what do we want to be able to say for ourselves? What do we want to be able to say we did? I could take that back to the beginning of the next adaptation plan I do and think about it from the beginning. So starting with the end in mind is really powerful once you get kind of good at this stuff. Okay. Um, oops, this is supposed to be audience too, but it's one. Anyways, stakeholders, let's talk about them. All right. So when we talk about stakeholders, that could be a lot of different folks. Stakeholders are people in your sphere that have a stake in what you're doing. But in this case, I'm really thinking about tribal members and maybe other residents. Uh, it could also look like visitors and employees, right? People that come on to you, if you have a reservation, that come on to the reservation. It might also look like partner agencies. Maybe you have a nonprofit or a university that you work with closely or other kind of service providers or even other government agencies that you partner with. Folks that have a, a stake in what you're doing, they may want you to report to them as well or share some successes, but that doesn't always look the same, right? So those progress reports that you created, they're probably more thinking about your tribal council or your grantors, probably wrote those with them in mind. And if they're super metricy, that's not, that's not a good mode for communicating with community members necessarily. So you might need a different way uh, to communicate that. And I've seen all sorts of different ways that people do that. So, you know, yes, you're gonna outline, if you have a progress report and it's public, you can throw it on your website. I wouldn't necessarily assume any of your tribal members are gonna like flip through that on a Sunday morning. But they might. <laughs> um, but what else? Um, I have seen, so here's a tribe on the right here, the Macaw tribe. They use something called a climate adaptation dashboard. It's not that different really than the progress report tables that we just looked at, but it's public. And it's at least it's sort of condensed and it just says, here's what we said we would do. And here's where it's at in terms of its status of completion. Is it in planning? Is it in process? Or is it completed? All right. At least people know what's your your community knows what's happening and when it's expected to be done. And maybe that's all they need to know. Maybe they just need to know that things are going on and at some point will they will be done and somebody's working on it and um, updating them. Shasta does things a little differently than that. So she has a whole website. I do. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> this is her website. She has a whole, and we should probably just pull the whole thing up, but it's a really beautiful climate change website where she puts all the reports and she puts some additional resources for her community where she boils things down in language that is more community friendly, including fact sheets about the exposures and some guidance for some things that community members can do for themselves, including accessing certain mental health and other health resources. Um, and she's also got something called Planet Paula, and she just she generally is doing engagement with her community somewhat regularly and keeping them in the loop on what she's doing. Great, Shasta, tell us more. Well, actually, I should kick this over to Tina because Tina is our web uh, or our, our social media person, which was sort of funny because when she first joined us, I said, "Do you have, you know, Instagram or Facebook?" And she says, "No, I don't do social media." I said, "Well, you are now." <laughs> So Tina, can you talk a little bit about our Planet Paula uh, Facebook and Instagram presence? Yeah, so like even today, for instance, uh, um, Flyer got kicked over for the gold-spotted um, 
borer, elk borer beetle. Um, and so, you know, yeah, it's just, we just keep the community informed on all of the, like the different things that we're doing. If we have um, like a swap shop, we posted on there. Um, I don't know, like when we gave away, when we we're giving away like seeds or plants, um, just like to keep them informed or even like um, just like a reminder, like, hey, remember we have a seed library, like yeah, um, new seeds have been, been put in there. Um, don't forget to check it out. Um, yeah, so yeah. I don't know. Well, sorry, sorry, not, not cutting you off. but <laughs> No, I was just thinking, yeah. So anyway, we're, yeah, we're just always trying to um, post stuff on like the Instagram and Facebook to keep the community um, informed and kind of in the loop of what's going on. Yeah, and uh, sometimes I'll send something over and uh, just say, hey, post this. And then we uh, are, are Kurt Rose, who is our uh, environmental or yeah, environmental planner. Um, he's a he's Mr. Mr. Meme. He does memes on his own account all the time. And so he'll he'll do stuff for us as well for the Instagram. And oh, thank you, Lori, for putting our account in the uh, in the in the chat. Um, but as far as the the reporting of successes, and that's a great place to do that, too, where we say, we have this swap shop and our swap shop is where people can take stuff for free and they can bring stuff to for other people to take. So it's really sort of like a, a pop up um, Salvation Army, you know, thrift store kind of a thing. Um, and so we can we post pictures of that and say, here's what we started with. We had a, a table and fishing rods and a guitar and, and all this stuff that people wanted to get out of their closet. And then we've got a picture of somebody else who's like this bad guitar right on you know and um that's that's great success that's that quantitative stuff but it also gets people excited about participating um so that was really those are always fun um same thing with with tina's seed library that is like it's based on a, a little free library model where people can just go and pick up seeds outside our, our learning center but there's metrics for that we started with you know say 50 packets of white sage seeds and then 25 of them have been taken you know, so we know that that's that's been a success, and an, an, that's another way to tell people about it is, we know, hey everybody, we're so excited that uh, we had to replace the the white sage seeds. That means you guys are taking them and growing them and share pictures with us. So then we can also encourage community members to share with us their successes on the programs that we are trying to implement with them. Let's see your compost pile. Let's take a look at those worms. Um, let's see your your plant that's growing. Um, I you will know, share a picture of your new solar panels or your electric vehicle, you know, so that's, that's a great way to get people involved in their own, um, reporting, you know, and it helps us inform our reporting when we have to go back to the leadership and the granting agencies in audience number one. So I, I would love to hear what other people do. If anything. <laughs> Like raise your hand if you have a newsletter. Do you have a newsletter? You know, do you have a, a website? If you have a website or or social media channels, feel free to drop those in the chat so we can check them out. Yeah, so also. Yeah, so what happens is it's gonna happen. Um I report to council and we have a radio station. Uh our council meetings come on the radio. And so I'm preparing for a um update on the climate um climate adaptation, um climate change and a climate adaptation plan. And so what happens usually after I go on radio, then um, usually the districts, and there's 11 districts, uh, district uh, meetings, they, uh, they ask me to attend. And then there's 66 communities that we live in. And sometimes they ask me to attend. So um, I know that after I do this next uh, update, I'm gonna be traveling around my reservation because I promised my people that I would show up if they asked. And so what I do is I bring them up to speed and then try to take a survey or try to get um, an idea of what their concerns are from the last time I spoke to them. And so uh, it's um, it's coming up, uh, call it a World Climate Change Summit. And then um, and I'll also do a water summit. And then both of these includes the youth on the nation. So I'm I'm not dreading it. I just know it's going to be a lot of work and takes a lot of time. But I mm -hmm. I promise when we made the that when we created a climate adaptation plan that it was our plan and that the people 
our stakeholders, which are the community members, they had a say. And we don't use majority rules at these community. We try to make uh, everybody has a say, even in the minority. And usually those are people that don't believe that climate change is happening. Mm -hmm. And so we address that as well, because um, our concern, well, what I tell them is that whether you believe it, climate change is happening or not, that is up to you. But the rest of us have to prepare. So in the process of preparation, you're included. And they may not like it, but that's that's how I deal with them. So um, that's it. Yeah, you raise a really important point that there are gonna be people who say climate change isn't happening. So my, my uh, approach to that is just not to argue about it with them um, and instead just give them incentives anyway. You know, whether they think it's happening or not, people still want free stuff, right? So, hey, drip irrigation, it's gonna save you some, some money on your water bill. Although we don't charge tribal members for water, that's probably gonna change soon. Um, but uh, little competitions uh, for things. And, and if they're interested in, uh, in participating in that, then, then they will. And if it means they're doing something that's climate healthy, then so be it, you don't have to, you don't have to make the argument um, if you give them an incentive to, to do things. People will take the path of least resistance and if the path of least resistance, if you if you make that climate change path easy, that's where they're more likely to do. Or if you put a little pot of gold at the end of that path, even if the path's a little chunky, um, you know, I know I will go down the more difficult path if there's a five gallon bucket of berries at the end of it. <laughs> yeah, I, just, I really like that thought about our plan and trying to really engage the community in this and have ownership and buy-in over it. And so I see that a lot. It's happening a lot. Sorry to bring in local experiences, but like the local governments are kind of starting to brand it even that way. It's just an interesting thing to do. One climate, our climate, one future. These are the words that they're using in their public engagement on this stuff. And when they do uh, workshops and things like that. What else? Anybody else want to share an example? So, so you're back. Back again. Okay, so I have to be going to another meeting. Um, so like everybody else, yeah, we have to do other things. But um, just wanted to say that um, what are we gonna? What I'm gonna address with uh, in council is that um, you know when I I think the IPCC put out a document that talked about climate change and health. And I think they brought up some things I never thought about, and that's valley fever. Mm. The, the increase of valley fever because of the dryness of the soil and the dust. And and also uh, for us, it, skin cancer. And we're thinking, well, we're desert people. We're dark. We don't get skin cancer. But the, um, the hours of sunshine at the intense heat is changing the way we dress and we go outside. So... That's something we never looked at as skin cancer, but now we're starting to think, wow, you know, now we have to use ointment and different things and clothes and stuff we never thought about. And so that's what a discussion on will bring out. But the other thing for the for the health part is the there's going to be probably an increase in heat stroke and uh, dehydration. And uh, all of them, even though uh, we live in a desert, uh, it's a joke. But it's really a problem because we don't drink enough water. But our joke is that if they say, hey, you need some, you want to drink a water? And they say, no, I just drank some three days ago. And so that's that's not healthy. That's not healthy for us, for for a diabetic, diabetic people like we are. But um, it's a reality that we don't drink a lot of water. And, and I think um, my campaign is to make sure at least two quarts a day and so um, at least uh, two quarts a day and so so these three things I'm thinking about is that I'm gonna try to bring these up at our at our next uh, council meeting to make sure that um, that we're going to address these because we know that we went through about uh, we went through the Rocky Mountain spotty fever and we went to the West Nile fever and then we went to COVID and we addressed all of these using the National Incident Command System uh, to help us move through our people to get our vaccination, all this stuff. And so I'm just going to add uh, valley fever 
as another thing we need to look at um, uh, because it, you, if you get it, it, it's pretty bad. And so um, with that, uh, thank you. Um, I know I haven't been here to all of the meetings because of I had to take care of my surgeries. And um, but I'll see you guys in a while, uh, in a couple of weeks, three weeks, and um, and thank you for allowing me to participate. And and I can tell you that um, I I heard something interesting um, by Saint Francis of Assisi. He said, um, "Start by doing what is necessary, uh, then do what is possible, and suddenly you will be doing the impossible." Hmm. And so with that, I thought, wow, so people that are working on your climate adaptation plan, you know, it's doable. And at the end of it, you're going to say you have something in front of you that you can pass on to the generations on down. Because none of us, no, no tribal members, all we have is stories about the past and how hot it got. But we ne nobody ever gave us a climate adaptation plan. And so... I know that because I had to create one and I'm thinking, wow, it took us five years just to get it off the ground. But, you know, so hang in there and, you know, and don't feel bad if it doesn't look good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, thank you, Salsa. And I will, I will greet you in November with a two liter bottle of water. Okay, there you go. <laughs> All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Also, really appreciate it. All right, bye. That was good. I got a little chill on that quote. Yeah. Yeah. And from one of the Catholic missionaries, uh, no less. Mm. <laughs> but yeah, you know, it was good. Good. Actually, the uh, I think the mission. Oh, no, it's Mission San Antonio. I was going to say the mission here in Paula, I think, was the St. Francis, but it's not. It's San Antonio. Anyway. You know, the, we have one more audience to get through. We'll get through it relatively quickly. Um, before we do, just want to mention one so a nice thing I went to recently in terms of recognizing and um, rewarding successes among your partners. So just don't forget, you know, the people that are supporting you, working hard for you, they may not need recognition, but it may help, right? It keeps the momentum going. It keeps people devoting their attention happily in your community's direction. So I was at an event recently. It was, um, it was uh, on the local government side of things, but they held like a 10 it was like their 10 year anniversary of this program and they brought in folks and they not just you know you can recognize them you bring them up um, they actually had a piece of artwork custom made for each of their partners that had done like an amazing thing so they kind of recognized the ones that had gone above and beyond and this beautiful custom artwork that they can now put in their art um in their office or whatever and like that sounds expensive but i think they just took what was really key and essential about this partner's contributions and had a um, local artist put it into an image and it was so beautiful and I bet it was really meaningful and I bet those partners are going to continue to kick some butt. <laughs> Go ahead, Lori. Just also on how to keep members informed um, and tri tribal folks probably know this already, but um, I think providing information However, your council likes it. Uh, we were working with um, a, a couple of different tribes, and I made this. It was it was beautiful. It made my beautiful word document. It had pictures. It had everything. One of the councils that I work with, that's not the way they like their information. Mm -hmm. And so it didn't matter how beautiful it was or how long I worked on it. That's not the way they wanted it. So. Find out the way they they want the information and give it to them in the way that works for them. Good point. Huge, huge. That very important, Lori, and gets back to my my earlier point about make sure you do things in a way that is uh, not just culturally appropriate, you know, with culture like with a big capital C, but also just culturally appropriate, like corporate culture. Which bleh, I can't believe I just said that, but uh, you know what I mean. What's going to work in one situation is not going to work in another. So, yeah, that's very important. So, um, our third audience one. <laughs> it was supposed to be a three. Um, on a, other tribes, and maybe this is a chance. So, you know, other tribes, but we could talk about beyond that as well. You know, other, we, other folks outside of our tribe. 
Um, so this could be your neighbors in your region, or it could look like all U.S. tribes. And like we we're talking about, I think we covered this one really well earlier under the reading. We we're talking about exchanging case studies, best practices, and lessons learned. That's maybe why to do this, and also adding in that other piece about inspiring each other, um, helping to build confidence that you can do it. Um, I just pulled a quote from Amelia Marchand, right? That's how you say that. I think she is with the citizens of Confederate tribes of Colville. She was also at that um, tribal climate camp. And she said, knowledge sharing between tribes is not new. There were trade routes across Northern California before colonization. During first contact, tribes on the East Coast would send runners as far west as possible to share the news. I just thought, yeah, this isn't new. That's true. But there's all sorts of very modern ways to exchange knowledge um, with each other, including like the camps and the summits and the conferences, trainings like this, and also reports like this, which was um, the status of tribes of climate change. This was actually, oh, is it already two years ago, 2021? They're yeah, they're working on the next one now. So this is, um, I think, led by ITEP, but a bunch of other folks collaborating and being involved and doing this really nice consolidation of what's going on with tribes across the country kind of capturing all those practices and case studies and lessons learned. Um, so sometimes we get lucky and somebody does this for us. Um, but what else? I'd like to hear from you all about how you're participating in knowledge exchange opportunities, anything beyond what we've already kind of talked about. And then I'd be interested in, um, you know, just since we're sort of starting to wrap up this particular series, if you feel that this one provided an opportunity to do that, um, and uh, what was what about it might have uh, been effective. So we will go to our mural. All right. Any other again, thoughts? Feel, in here? feel free to go to the mural if you if you so choose to uh, to add your own little little sticky notes. I'll put the the link in one more time. Uh, but these are the things that I added. Um, I'm sure there's others. I can't, I'm not thinking of any at the moment. Podcasts, maybe I've been on podcasts, which is always weird to me, but you know. Or interviews with media. Although it's not really, that's not really other tribes, but it's still, a, it's an audience that we talked about, the media audience. Oh, you know what? I'm gonna, Colleen. I'm gonna put you on the spot and uh, ask. Um, you know, you you work for a, a an intertribal consortium. So, uh, what kind of knowledge exchange do you do between the members of your consortium? So, I think what I'm really figuring it out is that all of our tribes seem very, and a lot of the entities in our region seem very siloed. Um even between the different villages, I feel like knowledge sharing isn't necessarily happening. Um, we just, it's funny that you said podcasts because we just budgeted for a podcast to share our successes in our BIA um, Tribal Climate Resiliency Grant. We thought that that would be a really good way to hit the younger generation and make sure that they know that things are happening and kind of, it's all about the vibe, right? You know, yeah. like- we're, we're positive things are happening like this is this is good let's be a part of it um so that's kind of what we're looking at and you know I I was hesitant too to get into the whole social media thing it's not my personal thing but I'm seeing that you know a lot of people are using it and so I I do see like our tribal conservation district uses um like Instagram and Facebook all the time um, I just don't know if all of the villages are connected to that. You know, I don't know that elders are like, you know, popping up on their phone and scrolling through and being like, oh, Colleen got some berries. That's good. Um, I'm figuring it out. I don't, you know, I don't know how to break down the silos between the villages or, or to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, you know, at this point, like, I feel like inviting everybody to a table and and making sure that we have like a regional advisory committee is is going to be like our big step for making sure everybody's involved. Um, I yeah I just I don't have the answer to like sharing um, 
with all of the other tribes yet. I, I do think that the podcast could be successful if we get that funding. Um, I would like to, to move forward with that. What else? Yeah, I don't know. I think it's just getting everybody on one page, breaking down the silos. So I, I mm-hmm. really think that like some sort of convening to make sure that each one of our councils are getting the information outside of social media would be really helpful. Um, yeah. Cause it all comes back to like, what format do they like it? I think that, you know, visuals tell a million words, right. But then storytelling is also super effective. Um, and I think that's how we want to be able to share with our councils. Yeah. I think um, it's, it's not easy and it's, like I keep saying, what works in one place may not work in another place. And, you know, for you, you have some challenges that I am completely unfamiliar with in terms of small, remote populations, you know, and I I, I can't help noticing that you're wearing a puffer jacket and a beanie and um, it's supposed, it's 91 degrees outside right now and it's supposed to get hotter before the day is over. So you're dealing with different weather issues. Can you even get to people? Because in, we talked a lot about heat today. We haven't talked about how when it's too cold to go outside. You know, do we yeah. have heating zones instead of cooling zones? So is it cold? Yeah. So we're like in the mid twenties and it's snowing right now. And I'm working from home because I couldn't get to work. <laughs> so, so there you go. Yeah, it's a really good example. You know, where our villages are hundreds of miles apart on icy roads that are like hazardous for nine months out of the year um so unless you're willing to get in the car with your emergency kit and like travel to each council meeting yeah we got to figure out other ways to make sure that everybody's on the same page yeah so even some of those knowledge exchange opportunities between tribes something like the national tribal and indigenous climate conference is it's tough to get from alaska to minneapolis um or uh where was the first one? Oh, the first one was was online because of, of COVID. But do you know where the next one's going to be? Anchorage. Yes. When National Tribal, the, the NTIC, National Tribal Indigenous Climate Conference. Uh, I'm going to take credit for that because somebody in our, our planning group said, where should we have the next one? I said, let's go to let's go to Alaska. And that's where it's going to be. Three I just days. wish it was in some place other than our Anchorage because I've been to Anchorage like four times now and I've never been anywhere else. Mm. <laughs> I wanted to go to Fairbanks or something. <laughs> What's our dates for that one? Uh, that is September, I want to say 9th through 12th of 2024. Yeah. Obviously. And you 24. brought up a good point about even being able to get there. You know, we have to budget like $500 just to get a car into Anchorage. Right. <laughs> you know, like, and then flying out, it's like, you know, another $1,000 to get to any of the lower 48. So yeah, we want to go to all these conferences and we want to participate, but yeah. getting there is a huge barrier. Huge. Yeah. Unless you, Lori, just put in the chat a Zoom chat for elders. I love that, you know. Ooh, so, yeah, oh. if you can get them to figure out Zoom, and this this is what you end up seeing when you have an elder trying to do it. They're like, "Am I doing this right? Is my camera on?" <laughs> That's <laughs> so true. <laughs> they hired some um, youth during the summer to go set up Zoom on an iPad for the different elders that weren't familiar with technology. And so they just have to press the button on their, on the iPad that the tribes provided. And it's been, it's been super sweet. The time is coming for all of us. I think that by the time I am an elder, there's probably going to be some sort of like a 3D virtual reality thing, you know, and uh, I'll be like, am I on the virtual? Am I, you know, can you see this? So yeah, it's, it's, I, I try to be, um, respectful of of how scary that technology can be for for some of the the folks who didn't grow up with it but um you know, we've got a lot of different ways you know listed here on on how to do this and um the one i keep push or uh, uh, hesitating on even though it's such a huge thing right now is tiktok we haven't gone to tiktok yet i'm just i'm just not ready for that You're i'm gonna not, need no. to work on your dance moves no. or something no, there's actually, here's a scary thing. A lot of young people are now citing TikTok as their primary source for news and information. Yeah. And so, and there are some people who actually, you know, seriously get on there and say, here's what's happening with XYZ um, event. But that scares me because there's no vetting process for whether that stuff is is for real. Snapchat um, 2023. 
Yeah, yeah. But I, I will also make this offer because I see, Lori, you asked um, if uh, Colleen can send out the podcast link when it's available, which I think it's great to share that stuff. We can also share those techniques with one another. So we're in the midst of working on some public service announcements for our radio station. Um, and we now we know Celso has a radio station. Other tribes have radio stations. And so it would be great to share those and say, here's what we did for ours. Maybe they can be an in, uh, not an incentive and an inspiration. Um, for something that you can do. Um, and we're trying to make ours kind of funny. I might be working on some videos. You guys know those commercials in, where the world is in black and white because everything is terrible. Like you open your cabinet and 25 different Tupperwares fall down on your head. And the voiceover says, has this ever happened to you? And then the world goes in color when you get this great new set of stacking lids and things that fit neatly in your cabinet. Well, we're going to do that for the environmental department, but it's going to be more like You've got something recyclable. Has this ever happened to you? Where do you put your recycling? You know, and then the world in color is going to be, here's your different bins. Here's the Paula transfer station. Here's how you know what to recycle and make them kind of funny. Um, and I would love to share those with other people and other tribes. So, you know, that's, I think, a good knowledge exchange opportunity, especially when it's funny or when it's not funny because, but then it becomes funny because I thought it was funny and everybody's like, Shasta thought she was funny. It's so funny that she's not funny. You know, so it can become very meta. <laughs> Thank you, Angie is typing in uh, my word salad and making shared templates and examples. <laughs> You'll put over here. I didn't know that you were creating radio PSA. So if you have a link drop, like link this little post-it over here. We haven't okay. made them yet. Um, Kurt is going to be re recording them next next week while the rest of us are at the Tribal uh, EPA Region 9 Conference in Viejas. <laughs> um, the other, only other thing I put here was just a little hot tip. My firm always, when, like oftentimes when we write a grant for anybody, we're writing in some kind of inter intertribal knowledge sharing and travel into your grants. That way you have the budget to do it and you have the required deliverable of your, you've assigned yourself something you have to do, which is to talk to each other. And that might look like I'm going to go to a few conferences. That might look like I'm going to bring together my regional tribes a couple of times a year, but like sneak it in as like a lower task of one of your other grants. It often gets awarded. Okay. Um, let's just wrap ourselves up here. We are so close to being done. Let's see. All right. Whoops. All right. So, um, I thought if we had time, we would have a little closing chat, but I really just wanted to open it up for any final thoughts and to say a big, big thank you for being part of this training community. We are, we have all this resource. Now we're going to figure out what to do with it. So that's one of the things, you know, if you have any thoughts, how should we use the slides, recordings, wisdom wells, and other materials to help tribes, right? All this wisdom we've just collected. If you have thoughts about how to use it, just like we were talking about sharing it with other tribes, um, how else can we distribute it and get it into the hands of folks that need it? Um, and yeah, I just want to acknowledge Shasta and Paula's leadership on all of this. I want to acknowledge our lovely state partners here that are probably get a gold star for being some of our MVPs, always coming to these things and offering their thoughts. I want to acknowledge all of you for continuing to make time to be here every month and for all the hard work you're doing and all the amazing experience you're gaining and sharing with others. Anyone else? I'll just return that thanks to Angie for doing um, all of the behind the scenes stuff to make this happen. I just show up and, and play the rodeo clown role. Um, and also thank you to Tina, my uh, behind the scenes support person who is always there quietly waiting for me to screw something up so she can fix it. Uh, and uh, uh, appreciate you being here, Tina. I feel like this is an Oscars speech, um, you know, but the, the person whose face is on it, um, seriously is just like standing on so many shoulders uh, or, you know, has their arms around so many shoulders that don't always make it to the screen. So yeah, thank you. And uh, we do have the, uh, the reflection um, in the worksheet 12 to complete for yourself, but we're also going to be sending out a link to a, a survey if you want to give us some feedback. And then um, you can also look at all of our 
videos. I just put the link in the chat. That's our YouTube page that has the playlist for all of these webinars, and this one will be added to it. It's also on the Paul Environmental, Environmental Department webpage. Um, and yeah, I'll pause it there. If anybody has anything uh, they'd uh, like to say as a final send off, we're all ears. Yeah, so could you drop that link um, to the survey while you're while yes. we're here? Uh, Lori, go ahead. Hey, sorry, I'm talking too much, but uh, I love this Never. class. I really love this class. Um, and I have pointed different tribes that I work with to different places um, on your website and to prosper sustainably just to help them start. And in my, in my tiny brain, I have um, an idea of maybe developing a part of a website or a website on its own that helps point. It's like the easy to tool, but with a, with a website that helps point you in the directions that you need to go to finish an adaptation plan, finish a vulnerability ses assessment, look at the things you want to lo look at, and that helps make it easy because it's super overwhelming if you have not worked on this before. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. You're one of our biggest champions, and it means a lot. And of course, we'll be seeing you at the summit in uh, November. So yay. And uh, you're, you're bringing Tyla, right? Yes, that's her dog, for those who don't know. <laughs> All right, well, uh, put the link to the survey in the chat, also to the, like I said, to the videos. Um, but yeah, I think just again, Thank you, everybody. Uh, appreciate you and everything you do. We are always here for you. You have our emails, you know our websites, uh, and uh, you will be hearing more from us. Um, this is not the end. It's not the end. So, Angie, I'll let you say the last, last goodbye. Oh, group hug, everybody. I, I love this work. So thanks for doing this with us. Yeah, there we go. Group hug. <laughs> All right. Enjoy the rest of your week, uh, and um, thank you again, everybody, and we will see you again in another venue soon. All right. Bye, all. See you at the summit. Bye.